Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is such a crazy case with a lot of different twists and turns and there are a lot of names involved in different ways that each person connects with the next and it's just so wild how all of this turns out. It's a case where we have most of the answers but not all of them and there are still so many things that are left out in the open that I'm sure everybody will have their opinions on and this is still a very much ongoing case so I'm really Really excited to hear what you all have to say about this case after hearing the details and to honestly see where this case ends up within the next few weeks and months. With that being said, there is a lot to go over, so let's just jump into today's case. Daniel Eric Markel, who went by Dan or Danny, was born in Montreal, Quebec, Canada on October 9th, 1972 to parents Ruth and Paul Markel. He then moved to the U.S. and went to college at Harvard University for his bachelor's degree. He then studied at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel for a fellowship, earning his master's degree in philosophy and politics from Cambridge. He then went to Harvard Law School, where he earned his Juris Doctorate to practice law. From there, he practiced law for a short time as a junior associate at a law firm in Washington, D.C., where he practiced white-collar criminal defense. After that, he moved to Florida and joined the faculty at Florida State University in 2005 and became a law professor, teaching a clinical law class. There, he was described as passionate and serious about his work. He had many different interests, and he was always writing about the things that he was passionate about. He was a well-respected member of the law faculty at FSU and was known as a prolific scholar in the areas of criminal law and punishment. He wrote a few law review articles on different topics, including abolishing the death penalty, as well as a critique piece on using shaming as a form of punishment. Many of his works were published in different university libraries as well as in the New York Times. He also had a blog where he would write all about all of his different ideas, being referred to as a pioneer of legal blogging. Then he even co-authored a published book called Privilege of Punish, Criminal Justice, and the Challenge of Family Ties. He was known to be someone who was very much passionate about his ideas, and even though he was very stubborn about his way of thinking, he was that way because he thought so deeply and so carefully about what he said and why. But even so, he was the type of person who encouraged debate and wanted to hear other ideas because he felt that it was important for law professors to discuss the important issues even if they were not the same opinion. Those who knew Dan described that he was the type of guy who loved to bring people together. If you were at a social gathering with Dan, he was the type of guy who would walk right up to you and introduce you to whoever he was talking to at the time. He wanted everybody in any social situation to fit in and partake in the group conversations. He was known to be brilliant and a very upfront and open person. He was never timid or cautious. He was out there and had no problem letting those around him know exactly what he thought or how he felt about any given topic. He was committed to excellence, expecting only the best from himself and his coworkers, colleagues, and his students. He expected the best from everybody around him. By the time Dan was 33 years old, by February 26, 2006, he was married to 26-year-old Wendy Adelson. Wendy was a third-year law student at the University of Miami at the time, and then after graduating, Dan helped Wendy land a job as a professor at FSU College of Law alongside him. By 2007, the two bought their home in Tallahassee, Florida, and then soon after, the couple would go on to have two sons, Ben and Lincoln. According to those who knew Dan, he was one of the most dedicated fathers you could know. He loved his children and was devoted to his family. However, soon after the children arrived, Wendy reported that things just went very downhill. For Wendy, Dan was an intelligent man with a big heart who loved her and the kids, but he was the safe option for her. She never felt a passionate love for him and always felt that he didn't see Wendy as his equal. She said that he tried to show her love in any way he knew how, but after the kids arrived, she realized that he was not the person for her. She felt lonely in her marriage with Dan. So, by September of 2012, 
Dan went away on a business trip only to come home to find that his wife of six years had packed up their belongings, took their two toddler aged boys, and left the home. She had filed for divorce on September 10th, 2012, stating that she had been unhappy for quite some time. According to other divorce filings, Dan said that Wendy took everything when she left. She took his family's jewelry and his tennis racket and removed thousands of dollars in cash and equities from their bank and investment accounts. She also packed up pretty much everything in the home, including the son's clothes, their toiletries, their beds, and all of the furniture in the home, leaving only a crib as well as Dan and Wendy's mattress lying on the floor in their bedroom and on that bed, she displayed the papers filing for divorce. She didn't leave an address or any way to contact her. According to Dan, this was just the most brutal way that somebody could have done this, and according to Wendy herself, there was nothing all that extreme that happened in their marriage. There was a few things that we will get into later, but she overall just didn't feel loved, and she wanted out. But her actions of taking everything from him definitely seemed like a huge slap in the face for pretty much no reason. Again, it's not like he did anything extreme. He didn't cheat on her. He didn't abuse her or treat her very badly. She just said that he was not the person for her and that they had a loveless marriage. So to me, this just feels like a very big slap in the face for someone who didn't really do anything to deserve it. After this, the couple went through a very bitter divorce process and a tumultuous custody battle for their two sons. At first, Wendy continuously gave Dan false information about where she took the children. But eventually, Dan did discover that Wendy moved to her parents' house in Coral Springs, Florida, which was way down south in Florida, just over a seven hours drive away from their home in Tallahassee. At this time, Wendy filed a motion with the courts to be able to relocate to South Florida with her children. She said that being in Coral Springs gave her the family support that she needed. She also said that she was offered a position at a South Florida law firm that offered more money and more opportunity for advancement. She said that she wanted majority custody of the boys, saying that Dan travels too much and never spent much time caring for the boys but that request to relocate was denied, so Wendy was to stay within the same county as Dan so that he was able to see his own children. Wendy would go on to say that Dan was saying negative things about her to their colleagues at FSU. She said that Dan told coworkers that Wendy had mental health issues and that she had stolen money from him. Dan also filed his own motions, one claiming that Wendy's filings are full of falsehoods, he said that Wendy was not being forthcoming about her financial assets, claiming that she underreported her assets by more than $240,000. He also said that she had this old two-carat diamond ring that belonged to his late grandmother, who was a Holocaust survivor, but Wendy had stolen it. He reported that Wendy's rich, affluent parents are helping her with all of the litigations, going on to say that Wendy, quote, helped herself to over $600,000 in cash, liquid equities, and other assets upon separation. Now, I do want to note that the Adelston family had a dental practice that Wendy's brother, Charlie, had been running at the time. They also owned several investment properties, and Charlie drove a Ferrari, so the family clearly had a lot of money. I will go more into the family in just a little bit, but that's sort of a pretext into how much money this family had and why Dan was so upset that Wendy took everything that they had. Then he filed another motion against Wendy's mother, Donna Adelson. In this motion, Dan reported that Donna had been making negative comments about him to his children. He said that Donna would tell their boys that he hated them, that he was stupid, and that he was taking them away from Donna. They would basically come back after visits with her and be like, hey dad, grandma said that you're stupid, or hey dad, grandma said that you're taking us away from her, and things like that. Because of this, he requested that Donna not be allowed unsupervised visitation with the boys. The issue was scheduled to be heard in court, but it was delayed time and time again and never ended up happening, and I will tell you why in just a little bit. For the months that followed, the couple went back and forth in court battle after court battle. 
They argued everything from finances, family heirlooms, whether they could sign the boys up for soccer, what the boys could eat, how often Dan would get to see them, and where they would go to kindergarten. By July 31st, 2013, the divorce was ultimately finalized by a marital settlement agreement without involvement in a court. By that time, their agreement was that they shared 50-50 custody of the children and shared parenting guidelines. Dan was also ordered to pay Wendy $841 per month, as well as a lump sum of $120,000 since he did get to keep the house. Their investment accounts and other properties were split between the two. However, this agreement did not satisfy Wendy or her family. It turned out that neither Wendy's mother, Donna, nor her brother, Charlie, ever liked Dan. The Adelson family wanted Wendy and the boys to move to Coral Springs no matter what it took. According to emails that were later uncovered, Donna suggested that Wendy offer Dan $1 million to allow the boys to relocate. They said that Wendy, Charlie, and Donna would all contribute a third to make up the full amount. But Wendy did not offer this to Dan. She didn't think that it was appropriate. Then Donna told Wendy that maybe instead of bribing him, she should threaten Dan that if they didn't move, the boys would be converted to Catholicism. Now, both Dan and Wendy's families were very strict Jewish families. So obviously, this would have been a lie, but they knew that Dan would be very upset with this, and they thought that maybe this threat would make Dan more convinced to allow Wendy to take the kids to Coral Springs. Because again, if he didn't allow that, they would be Catholics now instead of being Jewish. No idea how they thought this was going to work, but once again, Wendy did not end up making this threat. But this does just go to show how desperate Donna was to get those boys down by her and away from their father. Either way, by July of 2014, Dan was scheduled to spend the week with his boys per the 50-50 agreement made with his ex-wife. On the morning of July 18th, 2014, Dan drove his two sons to their daycare center about five miles away from his home, dropping them off by 8.50 a.m. After that, Dan went to Premier Health and Fitness Center, starting his workout by around 9.17 a.m. before leaving at 10.38 a.m. A few minutes later, while driving at 10.48 a.m., Dan made a phone call, I believe, to a friend, initially to talk about something related to the kid's school. But as he was talking and approaching his home, Dan told the friend that there was a car in his driveway that he didn't recognize. Then the friend heard what sounded like a loud grunt on the phone, and then the sound of a muffled conversation in the background, as well as what sounded like loud breathing. But Dan was no longer responding. Then the call ended. The friend tried calling Dan back, but he got no answer. Then, by 11 a.m., he tried texting Dan to see if he was okay, but once again, he got no answer. It turned out that Dan wasn't okay. He had been shot in his garage. By 11.02 a.m., a neighbor of Dan's called 911 to report that he heard a gunshot, and so he looked outside to see what was going on, and he saw that his neighbor's driver's side car window had been smashed in, and the man inside looked like he had been hurt because there was blood all over his head. He said that the car was still running in the driveway with the key in the ignition, and Dan did seem to still be alive because he was moving around in the car, but he wasn't responding to his calls to get his attention. 911, what's the address of your emergency? Okay, Houston. Okay, and the phone number you're calling from? Uh, I'm calling from. Okay, and tell me exactly what happened. Uh, we heard and looked in, the garage door was up, and I thought the gentleman was backing out, and I went back to my house, but he never backed out, and I came back over. And his wind, his his uh, driver's side uh, window is shattered, and he's battered and can't answer. He's inside. I don't know if somebody tried to shoot him or if he shot himself or what. I don't know. And it was at this location, correct? He didn't send an ambulance in a hurry. An EMT. He's still alive. He's moving. Okay. What what's he, what's going on with him? I don't know. The, the, the driver's side window is all bashed in, and he's got blood all over his head. He's not responding to me. I think you need to hurry. 
Yeah, I'm going to get them on the way to you. I just want to ask you a few questions, okay? Go ahead, but send them as, as you're asking. Yes, sir. They're already on the way, okay? Are okay. you with him now? I'm standing right outside the garage door. Can you tell me how old he is? Uh, I don't know. He looks like maybe 35 or 40. Hang on one second for me, okay? Okay. I'm changing the location. All right, sir. I apologize about that. What was the, uh, how old is the patient again? I'm sorry. I can't tell. He looks maybe 35 or 40. I don't know. Okay. And is he awake? He's just moving his head around, but he's not responding. I've, I've called his name, asked what's going on, or not called his name, but asked him what's happening. He's not responding to that, but his head's kind of rolling around. Okay. Is, is he conscious? Well, I can't tell. Okay. Is he breathing? I can't tell that. I'm assuming he's breathing if he's moving his head around. Did you ever hear him talk or anything? No. Okay. You said he's sitting in the car, right? Correct, in the driver's seat. Okay. Where driver's exactly seat. is he? In the driver's seat? You know, in the driver's seat. Is he in the garage or? In the garage. Okay. All right. I'm sending the paramedics to help you now. Just stay on the line. I'll tell you exactly what to do next. Okay. If it's safe to do so, see if he is conscious and breathing or moving at all, okay? I, it's not safe for me to do. I don't want to put my hand in here. Okay. Well, help's on the way. Okay. All right. I'll be standing by, and I've heard about break-ins in the area, and so I decided to walk over and take a look, and the garage door was up and asked him what was happening, and then I saw the window was shattered, and he's got blood. I'm going to be over here waiting for the EMT, honey. Okay, go ahead, but just tell the kids to hold on inside. They're okay. So tell them I'm out here. All right, just stay on the line with me for now, okay, sir? Okay, I'm I here. I got them on the way to you. Very good. I'm standing at the street, so if I see him coming down the street, I can direct him right in. So he he won't respond to you at all? I Not to me. Holler at him or anything? Window. Yeah, hey, he didn't respond, but his head kind of moving around. Okay. So I've walked away from the car right now. I'm standing at the street, so... And he's no. Okay. He's inside, the window shattered. The garage door was up. Okay. Where is the vehicle dispatched from? Um, I'm not sure. Give me a second. I'll try to see where they are. Okay. Where is it coming from? I got a. Uh, I'm checking. Okay. It's like one person's coming from McClay Road. Okay. Well, it may take them a while to get here. Then we're close to the hospital, so. Mhm. Mm so you're saying his head is bloody now? Yeah, it's been bloody. I mean, it's okay. the window shattered. I don't know if he's tried to shoot himself. I don't know what the situation is. He's still moving around, so he's alive. Okay. Okay, well, we need EMT. Well, the, the officer's going to be there first. They're not going to come until we figure out what's going on, but they're on the way as well, okay? He better be if this guy's got a shot living. Yes, sir. They're on the way as well, okay? Yeah. It looks like he could be the officer now. Is he there? Yeah, he's just coming up right now. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and let you go, sir, okay? Okay, very good. Thank you. Now, there was actually an error made on the dispatcher's end. They misreported the urgency level, basically putting it to a lower urgency, which resulted in a delay in the EMTs arriving to Dan's home. It actually took 19 minutes for help to arrive. When they did finally arrive to the scene, they found that Dan's car was parked in the garage. He was inside, slumped over at the driver's seat with blood all over his head. It was clear from the jump that Dan had suffered from a gunshot wound to his head. He was immediately transferred from the scene to the hospital, but unfortunately, the following day, 41-year-old Dan Markell died from his injuries. Of course, upon the discovery of Dan's body, police spoke with the people in the community to find out what they heard and saw. They first spoke with the neighbor who called 911 to report the shooting. This neighbor said that he heard the sound of a gunshot, so he immediately looked out of his window and he actually saw a small silver or light-colored vehicle that looked like a Prius 
backing out of Dan's driveway. It was pretty obvious that this Toyota Prius must have had something to do with the shooting since it can't be a coincidence that this car was in the driveway just a moment before a man is shot in his garage. So police went around the area to trace Dan's steps that morning to see if they could find any surveillance footage that could give them any better answers. So police went around the area to trace Dan's steps that morning to see if they could find any surveillance footage that could give them any better answers. So, after dropping the kids off at daycare, as we know, Dan went to Premier for a workout. Well, their parking lot actually had surveillance cameras, and once Dan's car was seen arriving to the parking lot, cameras picked up a silver or light green Toyota Prius entering the parking lot right after Dan parked his car. After Dan went into the gym, the Prius is seen moving around the parking lot to another spot before just sitting in the parking lot while Dan is working out. Nobody is ever seen leaving the Prius during that time. Then, when Dan left Premier, the same car was seen following closely behind him, also leaving the gym, driving in the same direction as Dan's car. Then, police found additional surveillance cameras that picked up the entrance to Dan's neighborhood. This camera picked up that same Toyota Prius following Dan's car into the neighborhood just before the time of the shooting. Now, all of this footage was pretty grainy, so it took a while to analyze the footage, but eventually they came to the conclusion that the car was most likely a green or silver 2006 to 2009 Toyota Prius. The car looked to have tinted windows and they noticed a SunPass transponder in the front. This is a device that allows you to go through toll roads. If you're from Illinois like me, it's called an iPass. Other states have Easy Pass and so on. So, using this, police looked into the SunPass records of all the cars that were on Alligator Alley and I-75 on the day of the murder. These are the roads that would have been used to get to Dan's home. It turned out that on that day, there was only one Prius that passed through those roads. This Prius and the SunPass transponder were both registered to a rental car company based out of Miami, Florida. Using that, police looked at the records of the people who rented a car from them in the days surrounding Dan's murder, and one name that stuck out to them was Luis Riviera. On the form, they listed a second name, listed as the renter's brother, a man named Sigfredo Garcia. This car was rented out from July 15th through July 21st, 2014. Each of these rental cars is equipped with a GPS monitor that reports its location to the rental company every 25 hours in case of a theft or non-return. On July 15th, it was located in Bay Village, Florida. By July 18th, it was in the area just around Dan's house in Tallahassee, Florida, before it returned to Miami on July 19th. Then, police looked into the cell phone records of these two men, and they found them to be consistent with the GPS data. It confirmed that these men were in the area of Dan's house on the date and time of the murder. I also want to note that as police were investigating these two men, a witness came forward to report seeing the other men and meeting up with them about a month before the murder. The witness said that the two men fitting Luis's and Sigfredo's description asked him to book a hotel room for the night of July 17th, 2014 in his name, so the witness's name, so that neither of the two men would be connected to the motel. The witness reported that he saw Luis holding a silver short barrel revolver when he met him. Turns out that police did find a bullet that matched a revolver at the scene, and they found no shell casings at the scene either. Of note, when shooting a gun like a semi-automatic pistol, shell casings will fly off and land on the ground. However, a revolver does not leave any shell casings, so unless someone sticks around the scene to pick up all of the shell casings before they leave, which does not seem to be the case in this case, that led investigators to believe that Dan was shot with a revolver, and it seemed to match the revolver that the witness saw Luis carrying. Now, Luis Riviera was apparently a big leader in a notorious Latin Kings gang which had a strong presence in Miami. So, at that time, police made the connection between them and Dan's murder. Now, as I'm saying all of this, it seems like it happened pretty quickly, but it actually took two years to investigate the entire thing. But by May of 2016, both men were arrested in connection to Dan's murder. However, 
The big question here was why in the world would these men from Miami make a seven hour drive all the way to North Florida just to kill a man that they had absolutely no connection to? Well, that is a big question that police needed to answer. So let's go back in time just a bit. Of course, after Dan's murder, police immediately took Wendy in for questioning. Of course, the fact that she was going through a very bitter divorce with Dan was obviously a big motive for wanting him dead. In the interview, Wendy seemed very distraught. She seemed pretty much, um, she pretty much immediately said that Dan treated her poorly and that she was worried that one of her friends may have done this to him, thinking that this was the right thing to do. I, I have a lot of friends. I know. How do you know that? Well, you had two of them up there for a last minute lunch date, right? Last minute. Well, I, I mean, they, you, you went up there, you're sitting with them, you have friends. I do. What I meant by it is that Danny didn't treat me very well, and I'm so scared that maybe someone did this, not because they hate Danny, but because they thought this was good somehow. Oh, are you saying that you think maybe one of your friends would have done something Who like this? Who would do this? I don't know. That's why I'm, that's why you're here. And that's why we're talking. Then as the interview progressed, she sort of talked about just her life with Dan and talked about the different people that, you know, could have been involved or the different people that knew him or liked him or disliked him. Several hours into the interview, Wendy brought up a man named Jeff who she had been dating. He was a fellow professor at FSU and the two had been seeing each other for nine months before Dan's death. According to Wendy, Jeff was unhappy with how Dan had treated Wendy in the past. She said that Dan and Jeff were actually cordial any time they happened to see each other, so there was never any reason for her to think that Jeff or Dan had any issues with one another. Obviously, Dan isn't gonna love seeing his ex-wife's new boyfriend, but other than that, there didn't seem to be any awkwardness. However, she did say that in the days before and after Dan's death, Jeff started to get a bit more jealous and possessive. He accused her of still wanting to talk to Dan and having a relationship with him. He got upset that she deleted text messages off her phone and things like that. Those are behaviors that he had never exhibited before that. He was not jealous of Danny. He spent a lot of time talking to me through, like, it's been a hard, it's been a contentious divorce. I mean, it's been a hard time. And so he would talk to me through things I would be upset about. Um, so, um, sorry, it's gonna happen now, I guess. Um, so, you know, I mean, he's, he's a therapist, so he would sit and let me talk for long periods of time about how sad I was about certain things or how upset I was about certain things. And he wouldn't, he would just listen and offer ideas of like, well, what if you tried, like, you know, if it upsets you that you hear from him so often, we have a parenting coordinator. Like, what if you ask the parenting coordinator to only have emails from him like twice a week instead of all day long every day, five days a week? You know, like he would listen and say, I'm so sorry you're going through this and then offer alternatives. But he was never like, I'm so pissed or, you know, he wasn't. He never like, showed emotion towards any of this. I mean, in the sense of like, I'm so sorry for you. Like, this sounds really hard. and I'm sorry you're dealing with this. You would hold me, you know, that kind of stuff. But not like I'm so angry. Did he did he ever meet Danny? Yeah, he met him a few times. Sometimes Danny would be late to pick up the kids and there'd be like an overlap where Jeff would come and um, so he had met him. There was like a boys, um, the boys sang at the Capitol one time and Danny was there and Jeff was there. And um, Danny seemed, I mean, I'm sure it's not fun to see your ex-wife with someone new, but Danny seemed, he was very pleasant and very fine about it. He was really appropriate and Jeff was like, you know, they'd say, hey, hey, you know, they wouldn't really, like, make a lot of small talk, but had, had, fine. Had Jeff ever been to your former house on Trescott? No. Does he have any, would he have any reason to go there? No. Does he know where? I think he would know where it is because 
I would sometimes take Trescott and sometimes not, kind of depending. Like, if, if I knew the kids were there and I thought I might have the chance of, like, running into them, then I didn't take Trescott. Um, if it was, like, nighttime and we were driving back from where from somewhere, sometimes I would take Trescott and I would be like, there's my former home. You know, like, it's, you know, I, I would. I would point it out. I, no, With him in the car. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't remember, like, a specific instance in which I did that, but I'm sure that would be something I'd say, like, wow, that was my house. Like, isn't it pretty? Or, you know. What What was the most recent time from now, the most recent past time, yeah. that you had this discussion about the trials and tribulations of your ex-husband and so forth with Jeff? It was all the time. All the time. So, two nights after questioning Wendy, police obviously brought Jeff in for questioning as well. Now, police were able to verify that Jeff had an alibi. He was over 100 miles away at the time of Dan's murder on a business trip, but even so, Jeff was able to provide some useful information to the police. It took many hours over the course of three police interviews, but eventually, Jeff mentioned to police that Wendy may not have been the person to look at here. He did not think that Wendy had this much resentment towards her ex-husband to want to kill him. But he said that Wendy's brother, Charlie, and her mother, Donna, absolutely hated Dan. And it wasn't like a normal kind of hate, but an obsessive kind. He said that they made it a sort of hobby out of hating Dan. Jeff ended up saying that if they were going to investigate anybody in the family, that they needed to look at Charlie and Donna. Then, during another police interview with Wendy, she also mentioned the fact that Donna and Charlie didn't like Dan. Obviously, she didn't think that they hated him enough to kill him, but Wendy mentioned that Charlie once joked about hiring a hitman to kill Dan. But she said that Charlie is always making jokes like that in bad taste. We all know that's always just saying off-the-wall things just to sort of get a rise out of people. So that's sort of what she thought about Charlie saying that. After joking about hiring a hitman, he said that it would be too expensive, so it would just be cheaper to get her a TV as a divorce gift rather than hiring a hitman. But again, Wendy did not think that he would actually have Dan murdered because that's such a huge thing that people don't normally think to do. So, of course, police continued digging and looking around to see if there was any connections between Charlie and Donna and the murder of Dan Markell. So, as the investigation continued, they obviously had the two men who they were confident had something to do with the murder. Their cell phone pings and GPS locations gave away the fact that they had been visiting the area on the day and time of the murder, which was not a coincidence since they drove all the way there from Miami. But at that point in the investigation, they hadn't looked into who these men had been communicating with at the time. So, the next step was to look into their cell phone communications. Police found that Sigfredo Garcia had been in frequent contact with a woman named Catherine Magbanwa. Catherine and Sigfredo had two children together, and they did live together, and they had dated previously, obviously, but the pair was no longer together. So, they were living together, but no longer in a relationship. However, at that time, Catherine was in another relationship. She was dating Charlie Adelson, Wendy's brother. So, they looked at all of the communications from Catherine's phone all throughout the month of July. It showed that on July 1st, she and Charlie's phones were pinging from Charlie's residence, most likely meaning that they were together there at the time. Starting at 11 a.m. that same day, her cell phone showed that she tried contacting her ex, Sigfredo, as many as 48 times. Finally, by 5 p.m., she was able to contact him and they spoke on the phone for six minutes. Then they found that nine minutes after the phone call between Catherine and Sigfredo ended, Sigfredo called Harvey Adelson, Charlie and Wendy's father and Donna's husband. But this call went to voicemail. For the two hours that followed that day, Catherine contacted Sigfredo over 30 additional times. Catherine then called Harvey again with the first call going to voicemail until he finally answered at 7.44 p.m. They spoke for about four and a half minutes. By later that evening, it appeared that Catherine and Charlie were no longer in the same vicinity together because they had spoken on the phone for a few minutes. 
Right after that call between those two, Catherine went back and forth between contacting Sigfredo and Charlie. After speaking with Catherine multiple times, Charlie then called Harvey, his father, at 9.58 p.m., but this call did go to voicemail. Throughout the rest of the night, once again, Catherine continued to contact Charlie and Sigfredo back and forth. Finally, by 12.43 a.m. on July 2nd, Charlie got into contact with his father, Harvey, and they spoke for about 12 minutes. Now, let's talk about the cell phone data from the day of the actual murder, July 18th, 2014. Between 12 and 12.23 a.m. that day, it appeared that both Sigfredo and Luis Rivera had been at a roadway inn in Tallahassee, Florida. Again, that matches with what we know from the witness who placed both of them at a Tallahassee motel. Their location at the hotel was confirmed by cell phone pings. During that time, Catherine contacted Sigfredo and then contacted Charlie. By 12.30 a.m., the GPS shows that the Prius heads towards the area of Dan's house. By 12.34 a.m., Catherine contacts Charlie, and right after that, Charlie contacts his mother, Donna. After speaking with Donna, Charlie calls Catherine again. By 8.09 a.m., Donna contacts Wendy and spoke with her briefly. As we know, from around 8.30 a.m. until 11 a.m., Dan is dropping off the kids, going to the gym, and then returned home. At 8.09 a.m. that morning, Dan spoke with Wendy briefly, most likely about the kids. As we know, that morning, the Prius is seen following Dan as he does his errands. By 9.12 a.m., Charlie contacts Wendy briefly. By 9.19 a.m., Wendy called Charlie back and they spoke for almost 20 minutes. As Sigfredo and Luis are known to be sitting in the parking lot of the Premier Fitness where Dan is working out, at 9.38 a.m., Charlie contacted Donna briefly. By 9.58 a.m., Charlie then contacted Catherine and the two spoke for six minutes. Between 10.07 and 10.09 a.m., Charlie and Catherine call each other back and forth three times, speaking for only a few seconds each time. Then, as we know, by 11.02 a.m., a neighbor heard a gunshot and reported seeing Dan in his car, looking like he had been hurt. By 11.06 a.m., Donna contacted Charlie. We don't know at that time if it was a call or text. By 11.22 a.m., Charlie contacted Donna and they spoke for seven minutes. Then at 11.30 and 11.31, Charlie contacted Catherine and they spoke for a total of five and a half minutes between those two calls. Then the day after that, as I mentioned, Wendy was taken into the police station for an interview with investigators. During that interrogation, Wendy called Donna to inform her of what happened to Dan and actually asked her to call Charlie and tell him because she didn't want to break the news to him. According to cell phone records, Donna did call Charlie, which went to voicemail, but then Charlie called back shortly after. The two spoke for a total of 12 minutes. And right after hanging up with his mother, Charlie called Catherine and they spoke for almost three minutes. Cell phone records indicate that Charlie was not in contact with anybody else after hearing the news of Dan's death. So, after seeing all of the cell phone communication, we see that there seems to be an obvious connection between Donna, Charlie, Catherine, and Sigfredo. It can't be a coincidence that almost every time after Charlie and Catherine spoke, she called Sigfredo. That could have been chalked up to a coincidence if it only happened on July 1st, but the fact that this happened literally as Dan was being shot by Sigfredo and Luis, and then after they were being questioned about it, that is not a coincidence. So the theory was that Charlie and Donna wanted Dan gone. So Charlie spoke with his girlfriend, Catherine, who happened to know a leader of a Latin Kings gang who set up a murder for hire plot, using Luis and Sigfredo to carry it out. Charlie, Donna, and the rest of the family had all of the money to put this kind of thing in action, so they just had to find the people willing to do it. But police needed more proof. So after this, the next thing police did was look into the financial records of Catherine Magbanwa. They found that before Dan's death, Catherine was employed at a Miami area dental office. But after the murder, Catherine started receiving checks from Adelston Institute for Aesthetics and Implant Dentistry. The check started in September of 2014, a few months after the murder, and were always for the amount of $407.58, and each check was signed by Donna. 
These checks came in every 10 days and continued until January of 2016. It also showed that in the 12 months leading to the murder, Catherine started making more and more cash deposits, totaling about $15,000, with 10,000 of that being deposited within the prior four months. In the year after Dan's murder, she deposited a total of $44,000 into her bank account. Most of these deposits were made at ATMs and were in increments of $300 to $2,000. However, police performed surveillance of Catherine to find out what her day-to-day -day movements were like. It turned out, once again, that Catherine did still live with Sigfredo in a townhouse with their two young children. She would go to work at a dermatology office in Fort Lauderdale during normal business hours during the day and would return home as normal in the evening. Nothing was off about that. However, at no point was she visiting the Adelson Dental Office. She did not seem to actually work for them. So, why was she so frequently receiving checks from them? They also found out that Catherine was driving a 2001 Lexus that was registered to Harvey, Charlie's father, and which was used by Charlie before she got it. She started using the Lexus back in September of 2015. Records show that this car was sold to her for about $1,700, but her bank accounts did not reflect a withdrawal or payment for this amount. So the thought here is, is that the Adelson family gave her this car and just did the paperwork to make it look like she owned it and she purchased it, but her bank records did not reflect that. To add to that, police report that according to her Facebook photos, Catherine got a very obvious breast enhancement surgery which the reason for mentioning that is that this surgery costs a lot of money, over $15,000 in most cases. Looking at all of her income from employment to federal tax returns and anything else on the books, there is no reason why she should be spending that much money and no indication for where that money is even coming from. The thought here is that Donna and Charlie are paying Catherine money and taking care of her after she set the murder for hire plot in motion. But again, just based on her behaviors and bank records, there was no way to actually prove this. So, as a part of their investigation, in April of 2016, police were able to intercept multiple interactions and phone calls between the people believed to be involved. So, what happened was that an undercover officer approached Donna, basically giving her an article about the murder, saying that he had information about a problem that they had up north, referring to the murder because, again, they lived in South Florida and Dan was murdered in North Florida. He said that his friend Tato, which was a nickname for Luis, was not being taken care of after what he did for them. He said that Tato told him everything, and if they didn't pay $5,000, they were going to do something with the information that they had about them. Because again, this guy was claiming that Tato told them everything and that they were going to expose them for what they did. So during that interaction with the undercover agent, they were able to wiretap the family. After this contact with the undercover agent, officers heard Donna call Charlie, kind of freaking out that somebody had information about them and was asking for money. In their phone calls, they were clearly talking cryptically, saying that they can't discuss the issue over the phone. After Donna contacted Charlie and told him what was going on, Charlie contacted Catherine to explain the situation to her. He explained that this person, the undercover agent, again unbeknownst to them, mentioned something about an ex-girlfriend being involved and Charlie wondered if he was referring to Catherine. After that, Charlie met up with his mother and the two spoke in person, but unfortunately, none of that conversation was heard. After speaking with Donna, Charlie then met up with Catherine and part of this conversation was recorded. Now, it took a while for this audio to be cleared up, but investigators did eventually figure out what was being said. Catherine is heard asking Charlie what kind of information the man who approached Donna knows. Does he know the murder weapon? Can he describe the suspect? What else does he know about the murder? Charlie then explained that they needed to do whatever they can to stop those people from contacting police if they do know anything. He said that maybe he will just pay them off, but they need to make sure that these people do not contact police. Then, Charlie said to Catherine that maybe they needed to make a one-time charity payment to the blackmailer, and if not, 
they would kill him. Apparently, he said, quote, And so help me God, if they F with my family, it's gonna be like effing that Nazi shit because this will be done. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Katie, I don't care what I spend, okay? I swear to God, Katie, Katie, this person doesn't know. Clearly, as we can see from this conversation, it seems like Charlie is freaking out that somebody knows something damning about them enough for them to want to pay them off. After this meeting, Charlie sets up a time to get dinner with his father, Harvey. Meanwhile, Catherine and Sigfredo talk multiple times and have multiple arguments. She gave Sigfredo the number that the undercover agent gave Donna and asked him to look into it. She does so with trying to disguise how she's saying it rather than giving a actual full phone number. She makes it seem like she's discussing the cost for something related to the kid's schooling. So the last four digits were like 6859. So she was like, oh, it costs 6859. Don't quote me on that. I don't know if those are the exact numbers, but that's kind of how she described it over the phone. Again, talking all cryptically over the phone because they know that this could either be an undercover agent or it could really be a blackmailer who they need to pay off. As this is happening on April 26th, Charlie is again speaking with Donna, telling her to stop worrying that things are okay and that he is taking care of things. Donna said that she felt better after the conversation. A few days later, on May 4th, the undercover agent texts Donna again, which made her worried again. So, the following day, her, Charlie, and Harvey all met up and spoke, but their conversation, unfortunately, was not captured. After this conversation, Charlie called Catherine and asked her how this person could have gotten Donna's phone number. They think that maybe the person found it online. By that same day, Donna and Charlie decided that they were going to pay this person $5,000 to keep them quiet, but they agreed that they needed to be firm enough to let this man know that this was a one-time deal and he was not getting paid again. After that, Donna called the undercover agent saying that she actually knows nothing about the murder of her ex-son-in-law. The agent pushes her a little bit, saying that she knows Catherine and she knows what she did. But again, she denied knowing anything. Then she called Charlie and told him what happened. After that, by April 28th, Charlie actually called the number that his mother gave him. The two spoke again about his problem up north, saying that Tato was not being taken care of. He demanded payment for Tato for his role in what he did for them. Once again, at first, Charlie denied knowing anything or anyone that he was talking about. But eventually, he said, okay, he was going to figure something out. Hello? Hola, diga. Hello, diga. Hi. Who is this? Who's this? Uh, someone's been calling my family and trying to figure out who this is. Uh, uh, it, in reference to what, man? Someone by the name of Sammy called? Yeah, that's me, man. All right, what's, what's going on? Well, what's going on is my brother Tato. Okay, my brother Tato has not been taken care of. His family's not been taken care of. I talked to a dentist. Why, why are you calling me? Who, who, who are you? I gave the number to a lady. I don't know Tato. You don't know Tato? I'm no. sure you know Katie and Tuto. Mm -hmm. They've been taken care of since the family problem been taken care of up north. I don't, I don't know who was, you I was, are. You don't? Well, this no. isn't going away, my friend, because let me tell you something. I was at Broward with Tato, and he told me the whole story. He told me nobody was taking care of him, nobody was taking care of his family. The family uh, was taking care of Katie and Tuto, and nothing's been taken care of with Tato. So we know, we know what's going on. And Tato needs to be taken care of, do the right thing. The lady already has the paperwork, she knows what I'm talking about. We know Katie, we know Tuto, we know we've been taken care of. All right, let me, let me look at no the No more f***ing around, man, no more f***ing around. This ain't going away, we need, Tato needs, you guys need to do the right thing for Tato. That's my brother, man. That's my brother, and he needs to be taken care of. His family needs to be taken care of, just like Katie and Tuto have been taken care of. Uh, I don't, I've never met 
message to get people. But let me call you back, okay? That's bullshit, man. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You know this lady. I don't know your relationship with this lady, but we know what the f*** is going on. Just take it away. Take care of Tato just like you take care of Katie and Tuto, man. Let me call you back. After that, by May 24th, that is when police finally contacted Sigfredo while he was at work. At the same time, police also tried contacting Catherine, but she would not come out of her house or answer the door. Catherine then called Sigfredo's work to let him know what happened, but Sigfredo's manager answered and told her that Sigfredo was speaking with the feds. I believe it was at that time that Sigfredo was arrested and police were staking out Catherine, but she wouldn't come out. By the following day, police finally got a warrant and arrested Sigfredo. About a week later, on June 2nd, Luis Rivera was also arrested. Both were charged with first-degree murder. Now, by October of 2016, Luis actually worked with prosecutors to accept a plea deal for his charges. He pleaded guilty to second-degree murder in exchange for providing the prosecution with more evidence to get Catherine arrested. At that time, Luis had been charged with an unrelated crime, and he was sentenced to 12 years for it. So, at that time, he was already in prison. So, in exchange for his guilty plea, he was actually given a 19-year sentence to run concurrently with his 12-year sentence. So, he will only be facing an additional seven years in prison for his part in the murder. Based on the evidence that they were able to obtain, as well as information given to the police by Louise, police finally arrested Catherine McBanwa and charged her with first-degree murder on October 1st, 2016. By September 25th, 2019, after delay after delay, five years after Dan Markell's murder, the trial for murder began, and Catherine and Sigfredo were being tried together. They were facing charges of first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and solicitation of murder. In their opening statements, the prosecution said that they believed Dan Markell was a problem for Wendy Adelson. They had a very tumultuous divorce, they fought about everything, and it was obvious that her family hated him. She wanted him out of the way, so her family had him killed as a desperate desire of the Adelson family to be able to move to South Florida with the boys. They argued that Wendy Adelson hired Catherine, Luis, and Sigfredo to carry out a murder-for-hire plot to get Dan out of the picture. They believed that, obviously, the connection to Catherine was made through Charlie because he was the one dating her, but they believed that Charlie and Donna both took part in paying Catherine out to have this murder organized. They think that Catherine is basically the one who got the two men to do it. All three worked together to murder their respected lawyer, and it seems that based on when these payments started, they had been planning this for about a year, or at least for about four months, because that's when the payments really picked up. The defense, on the other hand, they said that the prosecution is just desperate to get somebody behind bars for this, and that is why they are trying Catherine. They said that there is no direct evidence linking Catherine to the crime. They said that the people who are directly related to the murder of Dan, the Adelson family, none of them are being charged. Why? Because they don't have a case. The defense also pointed out how the prosecution was heavily relying on testimony from a man who they gave a plea deal to. A man who is a notorious gang leader, who is a convicted murderer, whose words can't be trusted. Meanwhile, the prosecution said that giving him a plea deal was a necessary evil that had to be done in order to connect all of the dots in this case and get every person responsible behind bars for their part in this. So, the prosecution talked about all of the evidence that I discussed with you up to this point. How bitter the divorce between Dan and Wendy was. The cell phone evidence that connected Catherine, Luis, Sigfredo, and Charlie. How Charlie was also in contact with his mother and father while all of this was happening. Like I said, Luis Rivera took a plea to testify against Catherine and Sigfredo at the trial. He said that him and Sigfredo made two trips up to Tallahassee. The first time they saw him, they didn't do anything. It wasn't until their second trip that he was killed. Now, Luis said that the two rented a car and started heading up north. 
he said that he went with Sigfredo thinking that they were just going to rob Dan. But he said that halfway through the drive, Sigfredo told Luis that they had to kill this man for some kids. When they got up there, he said that they followed Dan home from the gym. And as soon as they pulled up behind him at his house, Sigfredo got out of the car and immediately shot Dan two times in broad daylight. After that, he stated that they were both paid by Catherine for the murder, with his share being $37,000. He said that he never had any direct contact with the Adelson family, only with Catherine, who was acting as the middleman. Now, Wendy was actually given immunity in exchange for her testimony at trial, which really annoys me because I do think that she knows a lot more than she says. But either way, according to investigators, it didn't seem to them like she had any involvement or at least any involvement that they could prove. So, in her testimony, she said that she had asked for a divorce long before she actually left Dan. She described how Dan told her that if she divorced him, all she would have is the clothes on her back. So, that is why she left in the way she did. She talked about how she knew Charlie and Donna hated Dan, admitting that Donna asked Wendy to offer Dan a million dollars to let the kids move down south. She said that she never actually made that offer to Dan, but it shows that Donna was willing to pay a million dollars to get this problem taken care of. She testified how her brother did joke about hiring a hitman, but she never thought that he was serious. He was always joking about things like that, but she never took him seriously. She did not think and does not think that Charlie is capable of killing Dan. She was asked if she knew who killed Dan, and she said no. She said that after Dan died, though, she was scared for her life. She had no idea what was going on. She thought that someone might be after her or her children. She said she was sick and in shock after the death, and she said that she had nothing to do with it, and it deeply, deeply affected her. 2.30, he finds out in New York. By 11 p.m., he's walking in the door to your old house at Trescott Drive right? I don't know. But you do know that when he walks in the house, what he finds, you know that, right? Yes, I left him the papers. You left the divorce papers on the bed, right? Yes. Half the furniture was gone. Half the furniture was not gone. A good amount of his stuff was gone. Nothing of his was gone. The boy's stuff was gone, right? Some of the boy's things were gone. I'd taken enough so that I had for the boys, but no. You were gone? I, I was gone, yes. And so were his boys. Um, his boys were not gone. He saw them the next day, and they would not have been awake if he's coming home at 11 p.m. Let, let's let's stay on topic here. When he to walks in the door, when he walks in the door, the boys are not in the house, right? Correct. And you did not tell Professor Markell where you were taking the boys. He may have seen them the next day, but you did not let him know where you were going to be staying with his boys. With our boys? Yes. Your big brother, Charles Adelson. You complained to him about how bad Professor Markell was and how much you hated him and didn't want to be in a marriage with him. I definitely talked to my brother about how unhappy I was in my marriage. If that's the question, then yes. Let's is talk that the question? It. Yes, that is a question. You talked to your brother, Charles Adelson, about how bad your marriage was. I did, yes. Let's, let's talk about your brother's jokes now. You don't deny that he joked about hiring a hitman. He did. You don't deny that he repeated this joke. He did. And he made this joke right before a hitman murdered Professor Markell. I don't know that to be true. Okay. He made the joke right before, and I'll leave out the hitman part, Professor Markell was killed. He made the joke the morning that I talked to him. Can you think of one person in this world that would actually hire two, two people to go kill Professor Markell other than your family? Your Honor. Ms. Adelson, please answer. Please address me and answer it just the question. It calls for an unbelievable amount of speculation. I mean, I'm supposed. To, I'm. I'm responsible for coming up with. Uh, that's the prosecutor's duty, you know, to figure out who's responsible. You just said a moment ago that you you disagree that Hitman killed Professor Markell. That, that's what you said, right? So my question to you is, if you're able to say, well, it wasn't Hitman. Then who? Tell this jury. Who on this planet would have wanted to kill Professor Markell? I have no idea. All right, Ms. Adelson, I, I, I'm going to make one final attempt through questions to implore you. You understand that you can't protect your brother Charles, who's going through this case, and protect yourself at the same time. You understand that, right? 
I'm here to share the truth with you. I don't know how to answer the question. Then please end the madness and share the truth. Will you please share the truth with this jury? I've been sharing the truth since I walked in here. I've done nothing but share the truth. You know what happened here, despite your claims to the jury that you haven't looked at anything, you haven't discussed with anybody, and you haven't confronted your brother. You know what happened here, right? I do not know what happened here, and if I did, I would have shared it with the police eight years ago. You know that your brother went behind your back, don't you? I do not. Like he always does. This is something that he has always done, it isn't is it? Not. <laughs> you found out after that your brother had done this and gone behind your back. That's why you were thrown up at that dinner, right? No, it's not. You know that it didn't involve Katie either, right? I don't know anything about if you If you're not gonna say all of that and finally give the truth, why don't you just admit to this jury that you're guilty? Because I'm not guilty. However, her now ex-boyfriend, Jeff, who I mentioned earlier, he also testified. He said that he found Wendy's behaviors in the days leading up to the murder to be very weird. He said that their relationship was pretty strained in the weeks leading to the murder, but just a few days before the murder, Wendy confided in Jeff that Charlie had looked into buying a hitman to kill Dan. Jeff said that he knows that Wendy has made other comments like this before, but this time it didn't feel like a joke. He said it felt serious and very concerning and that his stomach flipped when he heard that. He called Wendy a superficially charming and deeply deceitful person. He said that the week before the murder until the 18th, he was going on a business trip, so he would be getting back or leaving the day that Dan had been killed. He said that him and Wendy hadn't talked regularly in the weeks before, but just before the murder happened, but just before the murder, suddenly Wendy was asking him questions about his business trip, how long he would be gone, and things like that. He thought that it was weird that she was asking these questions since they hadn't talked much other than that. Then he said that he was very surprised when Wendy named him as a potential suspect during their police interview. He said that he thought that Wendy must have forgotten that he was on a business trip that day, but he said the fact that she asked him multiple times when he would be back from his business trip just before the murder, to me, it kind of makes it seem like maybe she was planning on pinning this entire thing on him all along, not realizing that he was out of town and that he wasn't even around at the time. Then the prosecution talked about the spike in Catherine Luis's and Sigfredo's bank accounts in the weeks after the murder. In total, $100,000 was paid out by the Adelson family, each of them receiving their cuts. They spoke about the wiretapped conversations they heard and said that it was obvious that they were all talking about trying to cover up a murder. Catherine did end up taking the stand herself. She said that her and Charlie were not in a serious relationship. It was a very casual relationship. She said that the day after the murder, Charlie called her and told her that his ex-brother-in-law had been in an accident, but he did not tell her any other details. She said that she does believe that Charlie had something to do with Dan's death, but she denies having any involvement herself. You didn't ask Mr. Garcia to help this lady get her kids back in Tallahassee? No, ma'am. You didn't solicit him to commit a murder of Dan Markell? No, ma'am. Why did he put you on the payroll? Is that as a favor? Yes, ma'am. Not as payment for a murder? No, ma'am. Not to keep you happy? Why wouldn't he just pay me the cash? Why would I have to get a check from somewhere? I'm gonna ask the questions, okay? Yes, ma'am. All right, so he put you on the payroll two months after the homicide, yes? Two months after the homicide, mm -hmm. I will start in. Yes, ma'am. All right, and were you involved in a sexual relationship with Mr. Adelson at that time? I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, like at the time frame. I believe so. Okay, so you were still sleeping with him after the homicide? I believe so. And was there an actual job opening at the Adelson Institute that you filled with this position? No, ma'am. All right, so it's a position that he created for you? Yes, ma'am. All right, and you heard testimony from the employees that work there that they've never heard of anybody working remotely before in the history of that office. Why, why did Mr. Adelson create a position for you? Well, he, I asked before? him for a favor if he can do that. Okay. 
When did Secreto Garcia find out that Charlie Adelson was involved in this conspiracy? When did he find out? Yeah. I believe when he got arrested. Charlie told you he wanted this problem flushed. You were asked about that call on direct. Yes, ma'am. And was the problem the gang member who was threatening to extort his mother? I, I know he was just joking about that on that phone call, but I think it's because I used the restroom and then he referred to it as the problem flushing and because he was really talking to Yindra on the phone first. Right, and I got the whole reference to the bathroom humor, but the problem that he's referring to that he wants flushed is this guy that's extorting his mother, right? I believe so. All right. And flushed means he wants the problem resolved. I would assume. And you're the one to do it. I guess. And when did you find out that Dan Markell had been murdered? I found out when he got arrested, when Secreto got arrested. Why were you talking in code on the wire? Well, it's because I said that I'm either working, I'm at work, or I'm around my kids. Okay, and what does the code mean? What's it code for? What is the code for what? Why do you need a code? I code mean, because he's talking there's... about somebody, you know, that specific number, mm -hmm. and then he was talking about, um, you know, like trying to find out who is trying to contact his mom or trying to extort money from his mom. So every time that I would speak to him, I would just talk to, if, if like, Yindra is next to me, I'm not going to tell him, like, oh, oh, remember what we were talking about or whatever, and my conversation wasn't going to be like that around other people. All right. So, for example, when you spoke to Mr. Garcia, you told him that Ethan's clothes would cost $65.70. Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. And 6570 was the last four digits of that phone number, right? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And so was this an example of the type of code that you used? I guess. And is are you telling this jury that that was needed to protect your children or your coworkers in some way? Well, yeah, because I'm not disclosing any numbers around anybody else. Okay. Not saying a phone number out loud. At the end of this trial, which took about two weeks, the defense and prosecution both made their closing arguments. And after that, the jury of 12 was sent for their deliberations. After 11 hours of deliberation, the jury came back with their decisions. They found that Sigfredo was guilty of first-degree murder. However, they were deadlocked when it came to Catherine. State of Florida versus Sigfredo Garcia. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one, the defendant is guilty of first-degree murder. We, the jury, find as follows as to count two, the defendant is guilty of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. We, the jury, find as follows as to count three, the defendant is not guilty. So say we all this 11th day of October 2019. Mr. Russ, Russ Meisel, did I accurately reflect the verdict of the jury? Yes, you did, Your Honor. Right. Everybody be seated, please. All right. Uh, Mr. Russ Meisel, I take it from your notice to this, uh, Ms. McBannon, well, you, the jury is unable to come to a unanimous decision on any of the three charges. That's correct, Your Honor. All right. So, as to Ms. McBannon, what? Uh, I will declare this case mistried. Ten jurors felt that she was guilty, while two felt that the state did not prove her involvement beyond a reasonable doubt. So, for the time being, Catherine was not convicted. As for Sigfredo, for his first-degree murder charge, the prosecution was seeking the death penalty, but after consideration, Sigfredo did receive a sentence of life in prison behind bars without the possibility of parole. That the jury haven't found you guilty of murder in the first degree and conspiracy to commit first degree murder, I do adjudicate you guilty of each offense. On count one, I sentence you to life in prison. On count two, I sentence you to 30 years Department of Corrections to run consecutively to count one. Uh, as to count three, based upon the jury verdict of not guilty, I adjudicate you not guilty of that offense. After the first trial for Catherine ended in a mistrial, she went to trial for a second time in May of 2022. Once again, the same arguments were made for the prosecution and defense. They said that she was the one who hired Luis and Sigfredo to commit the murder because she got paid by the Adelson family, and so did Luis and Sigfredo. 
Once again, Luis was the star witness at the trial. He described what I mentioned earlier about how he followed them home. He described what I mentioned earlier about how they followed Dan home and then shot him in his garage while he was still in his car. He said that after that, he got $37,000, Sigfredo got $40,000, and Catherine got the rest of that $100,000 payout. The defense said that the prosecution was just cherry-picking evidence, leaving out evidence that could point to Catherine's innocence. Again, they said that Luis is a liar that he was originally facing the death penalty, and now that he got his deal, he will say whatever he can to keep his sentence of only seven additional years for a brutal murder. They said that Luis cannot be trusted. Catherine also testified at this trial, continuing to deny having anything to do with the murder, saying that the relationship she had with Charlie was nowhere near serious enough for her to be willing to do something like this for him. But again, she's leaving out the fact that she was paid very handsomely and was well taken care of by the Adelson family after coordinating this. The prosecution in this trial said that Charlie was actually the one that masterminded the entire thing. They said that Donna was also involved, which is proven by their constant communication around the time of the murder and after. The two spoke about the murder in code, which was picked up by that wiretapping that I mentioned earlier. They also talked about how after Dan's murder, the Adelson family quickly took Ben and Lincoln to South Florida and immediately changed their names from Markel to Adelson. Just like that, after Dan died, the Adelson family got exactly what they wanted. They took those boys, they wouldn't allow Dan's parents to see them, and virtually erased Dan from their lives altogether. So, Dan's death benefited them greatly and gave them exactly what they wanted. So, how can that just be a coincidence? At the end of this second trial, the jury went in for their deliberations. And this time, the jury did come back with a solid decision. They found that now 38-year-old Catherine McBonwa was guilty of the first-degree murder of Dan Markell. They said that while she did not pull the trigger, she played a pivotal part as the middleman to lead the shooters to Dan. Without her, the murder would not have taken place. In the case of the state of Florida versus Catherine D. McBanawa, case number 2016 CF3036, and 2018 CF 497. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one. A, the defendant is guilty of first degree murder. We, the jury, find as follows as to count two. A, the defendant is guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder. We, the jury, find as follows as to count three. A, the defendant is guilty of solicitation to commit first-degree murder. And it is signed and dated by the foreperson. She was found guilty for charges of first-degree murder, solicitation to commit murder, and conspiracy to commit murder. For this, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Which is the count of first-degree murder. You have been found guilty uh, by a jury. You will be adjudicated guilty, and you will be sentenced to life in prison with no eligibility for probation or parole. On count two, which is the conspiracy to commit murder, you have been found guilty by a jury, you will be adjudicated guilty, and you will be sentenced to a consecutive sentence of 30 years in the Department of Corrections. On count three, the solicitation to commit murder, you have been found guilty uh, by a jury of that count, you are adjudicated guilty, and you will be sentenced to a consecutive sentence of 30 years in the Department of Corrections. Now, like I mentioned earlier, this entire time, the prosecution alleged that the Adelson family, specifically Donna and Charlie, were the ones who orchestrated this entire murder-for-hire plot. For the longest time, none of them were ever charged with anything related to the murder. However, finally, by April 21st, 2022, Charlie Adelson was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, solicitation, and conspiracy. They reported that they found new evidence that gave them enough for an indictment. So, remember that footage that I mentioned earlier, where Charlie was being blackmailed by this undercover agent. The agent said that they needed to pay up $5,000 or else they might do something with the information that Tato was giving him. 
Well, that conversation between Charlie and Catherine at the restaurant was nowhere near clear when they first got it. It took them years, apparently, to clear it up and enhance it enough to hear what they were talking about. And shortly before he was arrested, that is when they heard him talking about threatening to kill the blackmailer if he didn't walk away after the payment. Again, their theory is that Charlie and Donna both took part in the plot to hire Catherine and pay her, Sigfredo, and Luis to murder Dan to allow the family to have the kids and take them with them down south. So, as of right now, Charlie has not yet been convicted of anything and Donna has yet to be charged with anything. In fact, Charlie's trial is just now starting. What we do know so far is that Catherine will actually be testifying against him at trial. So clearly, this whole idea of her having nothing to do with it, that might be thrown out the window. I'm very curious to see what she is going to say now that she has already been convicted. But as of right now, that is where the case sits. I do think I will do an update video with the information we find out from Charlie's trial and what comes of it. As of right now, as of the day I'm recording, the jury selection is still underway and we do have the witness list, so that is how we know about Catherine testifying. But other than that, we will have to wait and see what happens with Charlie's trial. I personally do think that Wendy knew about this. I also think Harvey knew about this. I think the entire family either knew about it or took part in it or took part in the aftermath. I don't think that Charlie and Donna would have just done this behind her back, knowing that Wendy would be really upset. I don't know, but I do feel like Wendy had to know. They could have planned this without her knowledge so that there was no way she could have like said anything to the police to make sure that she never got arrested for this so that the children could stay with their mother. But I do feel like she knew or at least had an idea of what was going on. Again, especially given what Jeff said about her behaviors and the days and weeks before and after the murder. I think that both Harvey, their father, and Donna, their mother, both took part in this. I think they both knew about the entire thing and I think they both took part in paying all three people off after the murder. I do wonder eventually if they will be charged. I hope they are because I do think that they took part in all of this and I think they know exactly what happened and I think they helped Charlie orchestrate this entire thing. The fact that Charlie was just now charged and is just now going to trial gives me hope that even years and years and years after, actually almost 10 years after the murder, that they are still investigating and still doing things to bring justice to Dan and his family. But with that, that is where I am going to end today's video. Again, as soon as I know more information about any new information that comes out about this case and the trial of Charlie, I will be coming out with an update video within the next few weeks or months. And if there is any new information about Donna or Harvey or anybody else involved in this, you guys will be the first to know. But that is where I'm going to end today's video and now I want to know your guys' thoughts. Do you think that the entire family had involvement? Do you think that Wendy knew about this? Do you think that Harvey and Donna both had something to do with it? Or do you think it was just Donna? Or do you think Charlie put all of this together? Let me know any thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on and make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All are going to be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye. <laughs>